Good morning. Good morning. What a patient class you are, waiting in silence very patiently. <laughs> welcome to Koreni. If this is not where you're going to be on a Sunday morning, you're especially welcome, but it's welcome anyway to all of you. And to those of you who can't be here but to watch us at home, uh, welcome everyone. Oh, before I forget, could we get the elders together for two minutes? Promise. <laughs> Cross my heart. Get only a couple of minutes at the end of the service, but if the elders could just stay behind, that would be really helpful. Just literally just to sort of one thing. Would you like to stand during the hymns? Oh, 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 we're getting close to normality now, are we not? You don't have to, and feel free to stay in your seats if you'd like, but if you want to stand, we're, we're taking all those small steps back towards what we recognise as uh, our worship as it used to be. So feel free to stand during the hymns. You still have to be gentle with your singing, so you can't just go bellowing like Pavarotti, uh, just because you can. So. Uh, but feel free if you would like to stand uh, at the beginning of the hymns, then we'll do that. Now, I've just thrown that in and I haven't spoken to my technical advisor, but that, is that okay? Oh, yeah, I can get the thumbs up. So, because we're not going to get to today, I'm just wanting to check if this might, there might not be an introduction to the hymns, but there is. Great. That's all the nuts and bolts stuff. We come to worship the Lord our God through prayer and song and love. Let us join together in our worship as God's community in this place to demonstrate his love for all his people. Let us begin by worshipping God in the hymn. 510, Jesus calls us here to meet him and we admit verse 4, just the first three verses of this hymn. Your faithfulness is eternal. 
the majesty of the heavens and the myriad wonders of the earth bear witness to your prophets. You have no competitor, no rival, no substitute. You are right and you are just. Your plans for us are good. We cannot exhaust your love. We cannot get our heads around it. But your love declares what you are like. And in Jesus Christ, we see enough to satisfy us forever. Lord, there are things which contradict all this. We do not see your will being done on earth. We admit to times when we ourselves have failed you by what we have done or what we have omitted to do. We have sinned and we have been sinned against. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy on our friends. Have mercy on our enemies for your name's sake. O oh God, our time on earth is short and your purpose is long. Guide us in the business that lies ahead this week. Help us in the things that challenge us. Keep us faithful. Grant us wisdom and true humility as we journey with you before us and behind us, above us and within us, through Jesus Christ and in the power of his Spirit. Good and gracious Father, we give thanks for blessings of home and family, of education and nurture, of art and science, for all who make peace, for all who build bridges, for all who have learned to forgive the past, we give thanks. For all good people and for all lovely things, we bless your marvelous creation. For our identity in Christ and for those who have explained this and loved it into our lives, we are truly grateful. For our place in Christ's church, for opportunities to serve and to be served, we say thank you. For the wonderful story of our salvation, for the prophets and apostles who named it, for the scriptures which carried it into our own history, we bless your marvellous purpose. We thank you that Jesus Christ did not only live for us, but died and rose again for us. We give thanks that he lives as the cornerstone of the universe, that we are built with him into a holy temple, unseen yet strong and lasting. He is our peace. He is peace within our own lives. He is peace between us all. And his peace is a gift for every situation. We bless your marvellous name. And now let us join our voices together in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. who has made two groups one, 
and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came in and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 30 to 34, and then switching to verse 53. <clears throat> The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And then from verse 53, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched were healed.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Lord. Amen. <coughs> Unity, or oneness, if you prefer, has been a theme that's been very much to the fore in recent times. Last week we saw the racial abuse of three English footballers because they missed a penalty kick in the final years of Wembley. But well, the experience was horrendous, but as they themselves have said, it was not unexpected. If they had scored and England had won the trophy, they would have been heroes. Instead, they were pilloried for missing something none of us would be able to come close to achieving. Especially not the keyboard warriors who spouted their hatred without even having the decency to put their names to it. Racism in whatever form it takes can never be tolerated, nor should it be allowed in any society that claims to have equality as a core value. Last week we read the moderator's letter about the massacre at Srebrenica, where Muslim men and boys were killed because of their race and religion. And we also heard the words of Edmund Burke. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. <coughs> it is not easy sometimes to stay up, stay up and stand out when it is not the popular view. But it is important that we stand beside our sisters and brothers of whatever race, religion, creed, or colour. Today's readings emphasise these themes, particularly Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. In that letter, Paul clearly calls for unity within the church as our expression of unity within Christ. From its very beginning, the Christian church had a division at its heart. Those born as Jews and those from Gentile or pagan, non-Jewish origins. We read in chapter, Acts chapter 6 that the Greek-speaking Jews had gone to the apostles to complain that their widows were not receiving the same support as those who spoke Hebrew. Prejudice, even at that, early point, at that point in the early community, reflected the fault line between those who felt they should remain within the Jewish fold and those like Paul, who would later advocate for the complete separation from Judaism and the acceptance of all into the Christian church, all those baptised in the name of Jesus. This division, as we heard, went by the rather unfashionable title of the circumcised and uncircumcised parties. And within that, actually Paul was playing on a pun. He was telling almost a joke about the type of behaviour and mark of difference that there was. Those who were born as Jews, those who came from non-Jewish backgrounds. And these words of Paul cut to the very heart of the problem. Here we have Paul, who famously described himself as the most Jewish of Jews, a man who not only was not only brought up in the faith, but had studied at the feet of the great rabbis of the age, including Gamaliel, telling those who he was writing to that they should accept non-Jews into their company as sisters and brothers in Christ. If anyone might be expected to uphold the old divisions, it would have been Paul. And yet he refused to allow those divisions to remain. He was absolutely clear. Here's what he says. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed the enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. So Christ came and preached the good news of peace to all to you Gentiles who were far away from God, and to the Jews who were near him. 
It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, are able to come into one spirit, into the presence of the Father. Paul is clear. The divisions are gone, the age-old them and us mindset that existed between Jews and non-Jews no longer existed in the kingdom of God. All people could now access the grace of Jesus Christ and achieve eternal life through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. It has been convincingly suggested that what we have here is, and what we call Paul's letter to the Ephesians, was actually a letter addressed to all the churches in Asia Minor. All the churches that Paul had either established or worked in. That as he sat in prison, probably during his time in Rome, he had composed what was his most theological and poetic letter. A letter that brought together so much of the teaching of giving Jews travels across the continent. The letter to the Ephesians is different from the other letters he wrote. Because most of his letters were written on the hoof, in the midst of action, travelling from place to place, dealing with problems that had been established, letters he'd received or complaints he had about very specific questions that he needed to address. Ephesians was a much broader letter. More considered, more composed, not in the heat of the moment, but after great thought, prayer and meditation. Many of you have heard me describe Paul, in my mind at least, as almost like a fiery Scotsman, a red-haired midfield general, if you like. I've always said Billy Bremner comes to mind, for those of you of a certain generation of football and supporters. Quick-tempered, grumpy, you can just imagine, you know, the sort of guy who would be lovely to be around most of the time, but every now and again the switch would flick and you'd see the eyes blaze and he'd come at you with whatever it was. But here we see another side of Paul's nature. That of the person best placed to bring Christians together. After all, if the man who had begun life as an ultra-Orthodox ultra Jew, who had persecuted the early Christian church, who had stood by as Stephen was martyred, who had travelled to Damascus, with a special license to root out Christians, but instead had met with the risen Christ on that road and seen his life turn around. If this man could accept Gentiles into the Christian church, who was there to oppose this opinion? Especially when Paul so rightly tied this instruction into the very mission of Jesus to bring all people together under the one God in the one heaven. I began this morning by talking about the racism and division we continue to experience in our present day society. And I am reminded that the Christian church down through the ages has done as much as any other group to create that division, to foster a racial difference. To make those who don't look like us feel second class or worse. We, as a church, need to atone for our sins. We need to ask forgiveness from all those we have persecuted. We need to see the error of our ways and, just like Paul, become reformed characters. Not just saying sorry, but meaning sorry. Those we as a church are persecuted, the unmarried mothers, the Jews, those from other faiths, those of other sexualities, those of other races, all these and more need to know that we now stand with them and will not walk away when things get tough. Paul gave his life as a Christian martyr, standing with those he had once persecuted. He did not shrink away when he was called upon to stand tall for his faith, and neither should we. 
when we encounter racism, persecution, injustice, homophobia, or any other forms of discrimination, we must stand by the victims. We must give voice to the voiceless, and we must not allow Buck's statement to continue to be true. All that is necessary for the triumph is evil. Or the triumph of evil is that good people do nothing. Amen. May God add His blessing to these thoughts. Let us continue by thinking about Christian unity. In the hymn 200, Christ is made the sure foundation. May they give and receive your peace. 
Let us ask God to provide for the hungry. We pray for all who thirst and hunger, for relief organisations, for the governments of the world, for those who rule in our island state. May they find peace, create peace, work for peace. Let us ask God to open places for good news. We pray for people who do not know how much you love them, and for all who share the gospel. May your spirit break down barriers, open hearts, bring peace. And now in the silence of our hearts, we bring before you our prayers for those we know of in need of your care, your comfort, your compassion and your blessing. These and all our prayers we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour, who brings us together in unity and love to be his people in this place. Amen. Let us close our worship this morning with the hymn 739, the Church's One Foundation.
the piss of the runway to you, the piss of the flowing air to you, the piss of the quiet death to you, the piss of the shining stars to you, and the piss of the infinite peace to each one of you. And the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each one of you now and forevermore.